Well, welcome back to the drought topic sessions with the South Dakota Grassland Coalition, everyone. I'm sitting here next to Jim Falstick, who for many, uh, introduction is not needed, but uh, a wealth of experience, a mentor, and, and someone who has an approach to ranching and farming that is, is one that has proved well for a, for a full career for him and, and the generation behind him, and even more that I'll just ask him to share with you now just kind of as an intro. Thanks, Tance, and thanks to you and NRCS for spearheading this series on drought. And uh, uh, obviously it's important right now, hopefully the, the drought breaks, but there'll be another one right behind it. And I suspect for some, uh, even yet this year, uh, right now it looks like for all of us. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jim Falstick. Uh, my wife, Carol, and I operate Daybreak Ranch. Uh, we have the next two generations involved as well with uh, Jackie and Adam uh, Roth, my son-in-law and daughter, and uh, their kids. Uh, their son Caleb is very active in, in the ranch and involved and interested. So hopefully we have some future to our operation, which is uh, another important reason why we need to be uh, sustainable and profitable and, and stay in business. So. Uh, our, we, we bought the ranch uh, from my parents, uh, January 1, 1973, and uh, in 1976, for those of you who live in eastern South Dakota, we had the worst uh, drought that many compared even worse than the 1930s, the, the old timers, my uncles and stuff that were operating then. Um, we, we went from a cow herd of about 250 down to 78 young ones, uh, two and three year old heifers basically. We sold our yearling heifers. Uh, we put up zero hay that year. We grazed our road ditches. We grazed everything. Uh, that was back in the days when um, I, I was under the impression you, you fed your way through the, the winter time instead of uh, grazing year round, which is our goal now. Uh, so we, we needed feed. We would have been short of feed even in a wet year uh, because we fed through the winter. Uh, so we went from 250 to 78 head of, of young cows, uh, had zero hay. We bought hay in western South Dakota because believe it or not, it was way wetter uh, in, in, south, in western South Dakota. Uh, lemon, lodgepole, uh, north of Wasta, Gordon, Nebraska, uh, in the Black Hills were all sources we could buy hay. Very unusual. Uh, a lot of times it's the other way around, but not that year. So uh, we were kind of up against the wall financially just starting. Uh, we, we bought the entire ranch, livestock, equipment, land, the whole ball of wax uh, uh, in, in 2000 or in 1973. And uh, so we were financially on the ropes and, and our factory was basically gone. Um, so I think one of the important things that, that this emphasizes is, uh, and I, I call it life after cows, if you will, because that was our sole uh, income source at that time. We found out in a hurry that's a pretty dangerous situation and uh, probably one of the best lessons learned when it, when it comes to drought planning. And, and maybe right now we ought to clarify that. We're, we're in a drought series uh, with the Grassland Coalition, but perhaps we really should call it disaster planning because we've been through uh, 120 inches of snow, fire, uh, grasshoppers can be an issue. So I think we need to look at this from a, a ranch protection standpoint from all disasters, not just drought. But, but just to clarify that, uh, we, we are talking about drought at this time. So one of the things we learned uh, the next year, uh, 1977, uh, it was amazing how with moisture the grasslands responded again. And I think it was a reflection, even though uh, we've done a lot since then with soil health, we were managing our pastures to keep some, some uh, litter on the on the ground and and some standing residue there wasn't any left after 1976 but at 77 it still responded because we'd taken care of the resources before that 
So what do we do? You know, the factory's gone. Uh, as I referred to life after cows, and uh, what we did is went out and bought, bought a bunch of ewes uh, and got into the sheep business. And I, I give credit uh, to the sheep business for us being in business today. Uh, that was at a time when, when it was easy uh, to get into sheep. There was a lot more sheep numbers in South Dakota. Uh, they were a lot easier to work with. They were cheaper to buy than cows. Plus, you had that dividend on their back and wool, which was pretty valuable back in those days. So you could lose the lambs off of a ewe and still pay her, her year's uh, wages. And uh, so that was one thing we did. Uh, in interestingly, I don't know whether there was a pheasant left on the place after that year. Very few deer. It was obvious what had happened to the wildlife populations because of that severe year. And, and I'll get into uh, a little bit later here how changing our operation has, has, has altered wildlife and the benefits as well. So anyhow, we, we added sheep. Uh, it turned into a very profitable enterprise. I uh, have told a number of groups in presentations over the years that the sheep kept us in the cattle business. Uh, one of the things that I didn't do, that if I had to do it over again, is I would immediately start custom grazing uh, some yearlings, yearling uh, steers or heifers. We didn't do that till a little later. My point is diversity is a huge part of drought planning, and I don't care whether it's a uh, uh, your your plant mix. Uh, if you've done some seedings, if you if you do have farm ground, uh, uh, again rotations, uh, uh, diversity, diversity, diversity. And one of the things we did to help drought proof our ranch is to add uh, some. Of, we put some of the marginal farm ground into warm season native grass plantings. And boy, that has really helped us with available forage in the summer. Unless you're on a year like 1976, nothing would have done any good that year. But we've been through a number of droughts since that our warm season grasses, our diversity in classes of livestock. Uh, and ultimately, what's this all about? Well, being profitable and, and staying in the ranching business. So uh, some of the, we, uh, we run some of our own yearlings. We custom graze yearlings. Uh, we run a custom uh, breeding heifer herd, uh, all with flexibility. Uh, any of our, our herd agreements, custom grazing agreements with uh, the livestock owners is that uh, with a two-week notice, those, those, that class of livestock, that herd needs to leave the operation. We've already, uh, and, and to put clarity with when this is being taped, uh, this is uh, April 8th, uh, 2022. So we are uh, basically three weeks from the 1st of May, which is one of our, our trigger dates, in fact, our last trigger date. Uh, and, and we've already given notice to the custom grazers that those cattle potentially have to leave. They, they've been noticed. Uh, we, we haven't given up because uh, not only do we know, but SDSU has documented on our ranch that the moisture we have and receive in April is a direct correlation uh, with how much grass we produce and ultimately how many pounds of beef we, we produce. Ab absolutely, the month of April is the most important in our operation, and every operation and location is different. So that's not a blanket statement for everybody, but, but a mighty important one. So we got till May 1, and uh, they've, they've assured us that, that they're willing to play the waiting game right with us uh, until the end of May. I haven't given up on this year yet. Uh, and that's why we haven't dispersed livestock to the degree that that we maybe should or could or will, uh, but we wanna, wanna make sure we don't do something we regret as well. So uh, we're, we're in the waiting game right now. One of the things we're doing, uh, one of the lessons learned back in the 70s and 80s is that we were spending way too much time and money feeding livestock. And uh, 
since then, we've tried to run a year-round grazing operation. We're feeding every critter on the place right now because uh, we were extremely dry last year. We were extremely lucky uh, to get moisture in September uh, and early October and had really nice regrowth. And the last thing we want to do is go out there and, and graze all that off uh, before it starts responding with the spring growth. Uh, I, obviously, we have some sacrifice areas where we're doing that, but we could be grazing. We've got good grass. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to ruin it for the year or for future years or for, for a potential response when the rains do start coming. So we're feeding everything. Uh, I, don't, I hate it uh, because we've grown to appreciate not having to feed, but we also have learned to respect the resources and, and take care of them. So um, just to summarize uh, the important aspects of, of uh, our operation and having a drought plan or a disaster plan, as I've already said, is uh, uh, number one, know what you have for resources out there. Uh, number two, uh, flexibility. Uh, it's huge. Uh, I see so many people get in a rut and, and uh, we run a cow-calf operation and, and, and I'm speaking as, as their, their uh, philosophy, uh, not ours. We calve in March, and that's the way we've always done it, and we sell in November, and, and we've learned that, that we need to be flexible. Each year is, is not the same, and uh, so we try to be flexible. And, and bottom line is this all boils down to being sustainable, and, and the huge thing where I was back in 1976 is we needed to straighten out our profitability. And by adding these different enterprises, uh, number one, the, the custom grazed steers, number two, our yearling heifer uh, grazing, which we can ship out or dry lot or whatever we have to. And the one I haven't mentioned yet uh, in, in the course of changing our, uh, our uh, uh, priorities, I'll say, uh, with taking care of the natural resources instead of just worrying about trying to get the most pounds off of a an acre. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there wasn't any wildlife left after 1976. And when we started making the natural resources our priority versus pounds that we could brag about in November, uh, the wildlife started responding. The diversity in our, in our range started responding. And uh, we actually got to the point where we had deer and pheasant numbers that were becoming a liability. So we started two different hunting enterprises, an upland bird enterprise uh, and an and, uh, uh, archery deer hunting enterprise that has, uh, again, just really reinforced our profitability and sustainability. And, and it was because we completely changed our operation. Jim, you've already really laid out a, a nice platform for us to understand the Daybreak Ranch and, and how here we are in 2022, you've come along over the course of the last 40 plus years, um, you and Carol operating and managing this place and now your son and daughter-in-law taking over or beginning to have- Son-in-law and daughter. Son-in-law and daughter, sorry. Close enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're, they're equal in your eyes now, I'm, I'm relatively certain. Um, it may not be so common as we'd like it to be um, for the priority order of, of resources on a ranch, whether that be the people, uh, the, the real estate itself, um, the grass that grows on it, the livestock. Um, would you share kind of uh, the, the priority order sure. of, of those resources? Because I think it's not as common as, as I hope it would be someday. Yeah, and, th and that's a tough one. When, you, when you've spent uh, a lifetime uh, in survival mode, if you will, uh, either because of economy, drought, whatever, pricing, uh, it's pretty easy to get wrapped up in day-to-day -day ranch operation. And that's been a tough one for me. Uh, uh, not only did I go through the, the first really disaster uh, drought in 1976, uh, but that went 
from that, we were just almost starting to recover, and we went into uh, the economic challenges of the 1980s and, and dealing with up to 22% interest and stuff when we were uh, had operating loans up to our eyeballs from startup in 1973 and the drought of 76. So another hard knock. And, uh, and, and again, the sheep business is probably what got us through those those uh, hard economic times. But I, al I also know that, that uh, it was a lot of sacrifice for my family, all, all, all the way from uh, 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 not having the finances to go have that fun vacation or whatever, to, to being uh, family labor, you know, and, and helping with that survival. And so that, that's a tough mode to be in, and, and I've tried to change that over the, the years. But it's still um, important to take care of the landscape and the, the resources on that landscape. And I, I've, I've really gotten involved probably because of those early years, uh, uh, knowing the value of taking care of those natural resources and how they'll take care of you. And, uh, so if, if number one, I'd say faith in God is number one because it's helped get through some of these trying times and, and the importance of family to support that and support you. Uh, uh, so I, I guess faith number one, family number two, and, and the land and, and the resources on it, I'd lump together because it's, it's all one in, in my opinion. Trust me, as I've said before, there is life after cows. I've been there. Uh, we went to sheep, we went to yearlings, we went to uh, hunting enterprises, all to, and, and frankly, it's, it's what's made us as profitable as we are because of, of the fact that when one of those is, is in the dump uh, price-wise or production-wise, uh, you can always, it, it, I look back and it's pretty scary to just have one enterprise. Uh, what if you had a disease outbreak? Uh, I mean, the list just goes on and on. I don't have to let my imagination run together, uh, but it's dangerous. And so since we've diversified, it's taken a lot of that mental pressure off of us, uh, not workload pressure. We still got plenty to do, but we've become more efficient about doing that too, as we, we've changed our operation. But uh, machinery, uh, it, it's, you know, I go back to the days of Gordon Hazard when he was in Highmore and gave a presentation that if it rusts, rots, or, or I forget the other one, uh, don't have it. Uh, and, and I've remembered that philosophy, and I got plenty of rust and rot around. Uh, I'm not saying that, but if you use that mindset to avoid as much of it as you can, uh, it, it's really easy on the economics. So there's plenty... And, and I don't want to paint a picture of, well, get rid of the cows and go out and farm everything. You know, we got high-priced grains. Let's, let's just tear that grass up. That's, that's, in my mind, the last thing you should do. But there's so many enterprises from custom grazing to renting grass out to uh, bringing another enterprise, another class of, of livestock in. To, and, I, and I think one of the things I think we're all guilty of and I'll say I, I was guilty of it, is not looking at those complementary uh, enterprises that fit in so nice with, with what you're already doing or what you have on the ranch. I, my business plan never included hunting operations. But I'm here to tell you, if you take care of your resources, uh, what a powerful way to reach out to the public to, to show them what good stewardship on the land does. So uh, just... Just fantastic opportunities, and I think we need to look at other opportunities and, and get past just being a cow factory. There's conflict in, across the ocean. There's drought here at home and a large swath of the upper Great Plains. Um, grain markets are high. And cattle markets fair, I guess, probably, but you know, if you're a seller, you could always use more. Right. Um, it, it's not a level playing field. Right, right. Um, there's a whole lot we don't know. 
we don't know what tomorrow brings. In fact, no. none of us is even guaranteed tomorrow. So, Jim, uh, I admire the way that you've described how the ranch has changed over the years uh, with with your management decisions and, and the factors at play. How do you operate? How do you make decisions in this environment where you constantly don't know the future? Um, only only what happened yeah. before. And, and it's it's probably as unstable as I've ever seen it, other than as a, a kid, I re remember the Cuban crisis. That was a comparable situation to where we are right now, I think. And I, I don't know whether we had a drought to go along with that or not, but I think things are about as unstable right now as I've ever seen. And I think uh, uh, the situation in Ukraine could uh, really develop into some, some real hunger situations. Uh, some shortages and uh, uh, who knows what the economy does. Uh, yeah, we got high prices right now. Two weeks it might not be worth anything. Uh, you, you just never know and it's as unstable as I believe I've ever seen it. We can't outguess that. Uh, we just have to be uh, uh, conscious of making wise decisions, I think. and. Uh, Again, I can't emphasize flexibility and diversity enough. And, and probably uh, the next thing, maybe even more important than that, is the relationships you have with uh, wise people, uh, business associates, other producers, uh, family members. Uh, and, and I think maybe some of the best lessons I've learned are, are from people completely outside agriculture. Um, so I, I, I think, uh, I, th I, th I th well, it, it's easy to get into a, a, a rut and keep doing things the way we always did and, and ignore the facts. And, but I think, I think flexibility and, and an open mind and being conscious. I think one of the things I do basically year round, unless everybody is, uh, nice and wet is to watch the U.S. drought monitor. Uh, we're talking about drought here and that's that's one of the indicators I see. I, I don't need it to know whether I'm dry, you know. <laughs> I always got that figured out. Probably got a good idea in South Dakota. But what's going on in the rest of the nation? What's going on in the rest of the world? Um, and, I, and I think those are all very, very important things to keep an eye on uh, as far as trends on how it's going to affect the marketing that you do have? How is it going to affect the consumer? How is it going to affect uh, any of the business associates? There's, there's many products that are hard to get right now and there's shortages and, and uh, we're seeing what high price fuel uh, can be again. And uh, as I already said, normally we try not to feed. Well, that's saving fuel, but we want to save the resources too. So we are feeding right now and uh, but one of one of the things we do as part of our drought plan is to to try to keep a year's forage on hand in in, in several forms it can be standing forage uh, uh, in, in dormant uh, stockpiled forage uh, it can be stored forage uh, or the or the moisture and that'll come up in my trigger dates the moisture so that we know we're at least capable of raising so we, we try to keep, uh, and, and I think that has really put a lot of stability into our operation. We have three hay sheds, and they're full right now. And the last thing I'd do is recommend anybody go out and build hay sheds under today's <laughs> costs. Mm -hmm. But we build them in a time when they paid for themselves in one year. Wow. Uh, we, we were also selling some hay at the time, uh, dairy quality hay, and uh, hay was high priced. and. Uh, uh, but I, I'd never do that again. Mm -hmm. It's just that it worked at that opportunity. So again, you, you have to constantly look at those opportunities and be flexible and open-minded on what you may need to do. So in practical application, Jim, I'd like to know, uh, we're north of Highmore, what, 15 miles here? Yeah, 12. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and other interviews, we've got Far West River, uh, we're, we're going to have Far East River, and you're somewhere in the middle. Um, is there a minimum amount of surface protection or plant residue cover that you try to maintain in a normal year 
or maybe it's different in a drought year, but after grazing. So you've used this pasture. You're not going to come back this season. Uh, how much is left? Yeah. So uh, as far as litter, we don't want to see any bare ground. That, that's the first thing we always look at. And, and I think you can have too much litter in some cases too. So, uh, and, and an example would be after 2019 when we were as extremely wet as, or 2020 it would have been, as, as extremely wet as we were extremely dry, we actually were understocked and ended up with enough litter that it, it smothered out some of the plants mm. in cases. I, I didn't think that'd ever happen, mm. but I didn't think we'd ever be that wet either. And, and even though we had extra yearlings on hand, uh, we, we did not put enough grazing pressure on certain, well, and let me back up, typically we, we uh, dormant rest some pasture season long uh, so that we do have some to start on the next spring, mm. early calving. Uh, and, and that's where we saw it, is there was actually too much thatch oh, in those. Sure. So it wasn't utilized in the growing season. Exactly. It was saved for next Exactly. Spring. And it was too much. It hurt us the next year. Hmm. So it, it can be overdone, but we try to keep the ground uh, covered as far as standing residue. Uh, I, I like to see six inches on our cool seasons and about a foot on our warm seasons. As I've mentioned, we do have some warm season uh, plantings that are that are on marginal farm ground, um, so I, I like you can't take those down as short as the cool seasons. So that's important. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess uh, our rule of thumb is, is six inches. I think the important thing in all that is the amount of rest. And like right now, we're sacrificing some areas uh, that haven't been grazed for a couple of years. Uh, we're taking them down really short, but the key thing is the rest that's going to come behind it. And uh, that, that may be two years, maybe three if it don't rain, maybe four. Right. Uh, we know those areas are not going to want to see livestock again for a considerable amount of time. But the amount of uh, pressure we're taking off of, of the grass that was grazed properly last year in the interest of having a, a good start this year is going to pay dividends in doing that. Perfect. Jim, you've indicated that on cool seasons you, you aim for a six inch residual height after grazing and on warm seasons often it's 12 inches. Clearly, and especially anybody that has ever hunted upland birds can visualize that that after grazing is still decent habitat to, to hunt in the fall um, as, as one potential cause for that uh, or, or result, not cause, but result of that. I'm curious what other benefits there are to leaving that kind of residual cover uh, after a grazing event. Well, uh, this, this has been a learning process for me over the years, and I wished I'd uh, known everything that I've gleaned over the years uh, uh, 50 years ago, but I didn't. Uh, so it's, it's been kind of an exciting journey, if you will, but NRCS came out and did some soil core samples on some of our ground, uh, comparing it uh, with where we had been using planned grazing and grazing management and across the fence uh, where it wasn't managed that way, more season long. And the infiltration rates on our well-managed grass, uh, the first inch of water went in in, uh, I believe it was 10.7 seconds. Really rapid. Yes, the, the second inch, uh, it took about 30 seconds, but two inches in less than a minute, mm -hmm. bottom line. And, that, and that's all we need to know about that. Right. Uh, okay. that's, that's soaking her up. Mm -hmm. So the value of having that residual uh, out there, uh, soil health, uh, standing plants to break that wind and uh, raindrops or snow hitting the ground, whatever, is so key in in increasing your organic matter, soil health, carbon, a lot of discussion on carbon these mm -hmm. days. Well, there's nothing better than grasslands than, uh, to save uh, carbon. So uh, it's, it's huge in having that residue out there, both standing and on the ground. Uh, again, bottom line, it goes back to profitability. 
Uh, if we're putting water in the ground, we get quicker recovery, we produce more pounds, we produce more beef, we produce more pheasants, uh, the, all complements each other. So. Yep, certainly, and, and I'm going to ask you a question here in another segment uh, regarding the rate of recovery when, when favorable conditions return, um, and I think, I think you'll be able to pull the blinds back a little bit even more on, on okay. some of the lasting values of those things. So, plant residues, grass, forbs, broadleaves, even shrubs that might be native or not native in your pastures um, are, are getting utilized by livestock in some way or another, uh, even if that is as simple as just being trampled to the ground. Right. Most people think that's wasted. I don't. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree because you're putting it, when, when a plant is in contact with the soil other than its roots, we're making food available to right. the microbiology in the soil, and that is what really creates pore space and that rapid water infiltration that you mentioned. Um, it, because if it's dry, you want to capture every drop of For sure. fault here, right? If it's not dry, you probably still want to capture That's every correct, drop. too. I, uh, I've said in a number of my drought presentations, I'm, I'm not out to be greedy, but I really don't want any water leaving the place. Mm -hmm. It's, it's too valuable. And for those of you that are on a rural water system, you know the value of, of <laughs> yeah, well, you know, every thousand gallons of water that you run through a tank or, or through your home. Um, if you assign that to infiltration across the acreage of your operation, uh, all of a sudden you can pretty, pretty easily hit million dollar rains or quarter million dollar rains in one event. Well, and, and let's talk about another aspect of that. You bring up infiltration. There's been uh, several years where we had uh, adequate grass, in fact, good grass, but it came uh, in, in runoff events that were zero, uh, either slow or, or the time of year it came. And so I think something important to keep in mind in that drought plan, and something I haven't mentioned, is the fact that since every year since uh, 1973, we have put in additional water lines and tanks because there's years where we didn't have any drinking water for the livestock, but we had good grass. Yep. And uh, uh, we've pretty well uh, handled that situation by having a tank in every pasture that we own or rent. Mm -hmm. So the, the infiltration's great. Don't do any good to have a dam full of water if you don't have any grass. And uh, with good soil health, it, it soon turns that around. Yep, yep. In fact, that can be an indicator <laughs> that, right. that you're doing right. the right thing. Yep. Is, is if, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's runoff occurring in the countryside, but not on your place, something right is happening. Um, kind of went off on a rabbit trail there, Jim. But yeah, uh, that was my fault. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I, I, I laid the stage, and you, you took it. Uh, <laughs> Can we expect land managed like you manage yours to respond rapidly when favorable conditions return? Yeah, and I think that's the thing we've seen that's just amazing. And there's been a couple different times that we've bought ground that was season-long grazed. And it's just unbelievable the difference uh, in production, even on a wet year, mm -hmm. on those pastures that have been season-long grazed for so long. And so it, it pretty well proves the point. And, and as I already mentioned, in 1977, after the bad 76 drought, the response on, on grasslands was just unbelievable. I, I, I couldn't believe it myself. And so if you have good soil health, you take care of it. What, what I see happen so many times, and it's, it's really scary as I travel across the country, is, is people think, well, uh, grass is grass, and we're going to get it all, I guess. And so there's nothing left out there. They may be feeding them, but they're still out there chewing the rest into the ground uh, as, as it responds. And boy, talk about a re recipe for disaster. And, and it takes so many years for that to recover back to, to the capabilities it can. And I, I get it. They need to be someplace. You need to survive economically. I guess what I'm saying is if you have a drought plan, if, if you get diversity worked into your operation, both uh, on the landscape and as enterprises, you can start managing around that. And it's, it's changed our profitability around so much that I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it, but I survived. I guess I should be uh, pretty excited. <laughs> right. so. yeah. Yep. yeah, certainly in, in the, the 
time span of, of your career, you probably have friends that, that didn't make those adjustments and oh, adapt yeah, those, and no longer ranch. That's that's right. Those years, uh, and, and the drought of 76 started it, and then the economic trials of the 80s was really a one-two punch that, that put just a number of my neighbors and friends out of the cattle business and, and, and out of the out of the ag business period uh, and boy that's that's tough lessons there mm -hmm. um, what do they say you know to ignore history is to yeah. prepare to repeat it yeah um, we don't exactly. want that that's that's really the motivation behind this project is to share some ideas and and skill sets that uh, members of the grassland coalition have so that uh, maybe for those of you who are in a really really tough situation that maybe some of these alternatives are helpful in that uh, even if things look different uh, we still want you in agriculture well and I think one of the important motivations to the coalition board to do this is is the fact that hopefully people will reach out to uh, mentors the people they're seeing on these videos uh, NRCS folks, I mean, there's there's a host of experts out there that can really give some guidance. And I'll tell you, it's a pretty lonely world out there if you think you're going broke and don't know what you're going to feed the cows tomorrow. And uh, people really need to reach out to folks and, and, and glean some advice. Maybe their minister might be the good place to start, but it's important. So we talk a lot about management. In, in this series of questions and, and how your decisions have had impacts on the landscape. Uh, whether you intended to or not, there's a, a, a reaction to the action that you've taken as the human manager on, on these acres. So Jim, I'd like to know maybe what it looks like, but, but in a summary, how important is planning your grazing rotation from one year to the next? Well, it's, it's extremely important. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is to, to graze year round and we use some crop aftermath in that program. But where there's two times of the year that are, are really uh, important and, and I'll go so far as to say stressful when it comes to grass management. One's in the fall. You start, like last fall, we had the opportunity to graze that regrowth off and, and the cow's got to be someplace. We did that in a few places, but most of it we tried to stay off of that. The other important time is in the spring when you start. And so those, those are very critical times to where you can really uh, ruin your grazing and plan for the year. So one of the things we do is carefully plan for where we want to be in the spring to start out. In other words, that April time frame, maybe even late March. Uh, we calve our cow herd in May, uh, so typically we're out grazing all, all, all winter long unless the snow's too deep or uh, we're short of forage. Uh, so we, uh, we defer grazing on, on certain pastures that we're going to use, and, and we try to do this at a different time each year, but we defer uh, grazing all summer and fall on some pastures that we'll start on in that March, April time frame because it's going to start growing faster, it's going to produce better, it's going to respond easier to the moisture you've built up. Uh, you got a lot of dormant grass there so you, you don't need to worry about those grass tetany things because when they take a uh, mouth full of green grass they get half old grass to go along with it. So it's a nice buffer to start into your grazing program. It's also a really nice place for those baby calves to be born, uh, clean and protection. And, and so we, we, uh, we also, in our calving area, and uh, we've got eight pastures that, that we specifically calve in, sometimes more. But we, we will, uh, on a normal year, and this might not be normal, so I have to be careful, but on a normal year, we completely defer two of those eight pastures for the entire year uh, to start in in our, our calving the following year. And of course, we got to have them someplace going in into calving. So I say we calve in May, but they need to be someplace in April too. So about the middle of April, those, those pastures are the ones we'd go into. Grass is typically responding. You got good cover. You got good, good ground cover and moisture buildup. So that 
that fall and spring planning uh, is so critical. One of the other things we deal with in this area, and it, it's, I hate it, but brome grass is increasing uh, unbelievable amounts in these native pastures. And so we try to, to uh, plan our stocking uh, of yearlings over and above the cow herd uh, to take care of that extra flush of brome grass. Uh, two years ago, it was also sweet clover. And uh, as I've already mentioned, we didn't have adequate stocking numbers that year. But, but that's some of the things you need to look at. And so we have to be flexible to take care of drought years like this. We have to be flexible to take care of the super productive years like 2020 when we had brome grass waist high and sweet clover chest high. Uh, but we tried to never let either one of those get that tall. And uh, that takes some numbers to do that and, and the flexibility. So it, it's, it's all a bit of guesswork uh, planning for the following year when you don't know what you're going to get for moisture, but that's why a drought plan is so critical and trigger dates even more critical. Very helpful. Um, are you using uh, any specific tools uh, as you assess how much forage you have and as you're kind of getting into that growing season, particularly determining um, you know, maybe how many of those stock or cattle are from outside the operation are coming on? Yeah. Are you using the grazing stick? Are you clipping? Yep. Are you having an RCS come out and do that? What's that look like here? We, we've used it all. Uh, Adam actually, uh, of course, both of us have been through the grazing school. That's an important start. But Adam has a, a weather station that re records uh, moisture, wind, temperature, and all sorts of things every 15 minutes and, and uh, documents it to his computer which also has NRCS drought tool in it. So that's an important tool. As I've already mentioned, we watch the drought monitor. We keep track of our own moisture. Um, what else do we do? Oh, I use the grazing stick. We have. Uh, uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, I'm 72 years old. If I haven't learned some of that just by eye, uh, there's no hope. So I, I, don't, I don't use uh, the grazing stick. I think it's a fantastic tool, but I, I'll be honest, I don't use it very seldom any, anymore because uh, I, I know when there's trouble and I know when it's good. Well, so thankfully it doesn't have one in reach right now. You'd probably smack <laughs> me with it. <laughs> nope. It, it does have some uses mm -hmm. other than measuring grass. So. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, and, and I asked that question kind of thinking that that might be Jim's response. And, and the point is, folks, that, that when you're training your eye and, and learning these techniques, you may need to use those tools to, to learn to visually calibrate. And, and then maybe simply walking out into a pasture will give you a pretty good feel for it, much like Jim has now and, and, and Adam. But uh, the more information, the better. Uh, use it to your, to your advantage. And these tools are there. And, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit, and I really admire the people that will go out and, and clip and really find out what they got because it can be a real eye-opener. And, and especially early in your career, I think it's very important. But, but uh, that's the way you really know what you have out there and, and what the potential is. I, I like to use a soil probe. I, I like to know what we're, where we're at for moisture, and that can vary an awful lot. Um, Last year, Adam's got an app that records supposedly what, how much rainfall fell in different areas. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, 60 hundreds, and he's about three miles away from me. He had 30 hundreds, but he said, in between us, it says we got an inch 70. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. But <laughs> we had cows there, and, and I went down there, and there was actually water standing in the pasture. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty seldom thing to happen in 2021. And uh, then I had a neighbor that's kind of in line with the way the, that cloud was going uh, that I talked to him and he'd had over two inches. Mm -hmm. So we were all there with it probably about three miles apart from each other and it varied that much. So wow. just what happens at your rain gauge or, or what the 
nearest weather station says or Kelloland says, uh, don't prove much. You need to get out there and see what you, you really have. And, and we've got multiple rain gauges put up uh, on the ranch uh, in some of the outlying areas so we can keep track of what we're actually getting. Very good. So you can adapt according right. to different Cause we had Because we had some places that were way drier than here at the home ranch last mm -hmm. year. Important. So, and this might be able to prove your, your neighbors right or wrong when they say you get more rain than they do. That's yeah. true. <laughs> it goes both ways on that street. Sure does. <laughs> so we talked about the annual grazing plan uh, and, and its importance and, and how that may look different from one year to the next or even one part of a growing season to another part of that same growing season just as the conditions change. Um, and in this case, maybe even implementing a drought plan uh, for 2022. But Jim, I wondered if you would discuss the, the lasting value you see from having a, a written plan when it comes to the pasture rotation that's at your disposal, uh, both for grazing and if it's a different document or maybe it's incorporated, having a drought plan. Well, I, I think Plan is the key word, and it, it goes way, way further than that. And when I when I took uh, my first holistic planning school and the ranching for profit school, which I would suggest uh, if if you haven't taken it, you need to. But at the uh, I believe it was the ranching for profit school, we had to put down a goal where we wanted to be, and and one of our goals was uh, what what we wanted the ranch to look like in 20 years. And, and so often, I think we're so busy putting out fires for today that, that we aren't really planning and looking ahead. So planning is extremely important. And when you start making decisions based on what you want things to be and look like in 20 years, it really changes your approach and, 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 and decisions in a lot of cases of what you make. And I, I don't care whether it's from a business standpoint or grazing standpoint or future standpoint. When you start looking at that long-term effect, it's, uh, it's extremely important and it really helps you get to where you want to be. So uh, from a grass and, and drought, and, and I'm going to say disaster planning again, Tance, because yeah. uh, there's so many things that can be other than just drought, even though that's what we're talking about today. Uh, but, but to have that plan for 20 years down the road, you better be ready to handle a major fire or, or uh, 100 inches of snow or whatever. And so when you start making that plan, I'm not sure you can have one without the other. I'm not sure you can have your whole holistic plan together without having those as well as other aspects of it. And, and if, if you don't have a drought plan to go along with, with your regular grazing plan, it's a recipe for a disaster because all of a sudden you'll run out of grass, uh, you'll, you'll run out of places to go, you'll start coming back too soon in your rotation if you're doing that more than once a year. Uh, and I, I don't like grazing a pasture more than once a year. Uh, we do it in certain circumstances, it depends on the, the year, uh, uh, what's growing there, what you're managing, what kind of diversity you're trying to manage. but. Uh, uh, I, I would say uh, a, a planned grazing system without a, a disaster plan to go along with it is a recipe for a disaster. Yep. All of a sudden, things were good, and now it's a crisis. Yep. Because um, we didn't. See and and it, and it might not even be that year. It might be yeah. the next year. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of where we're at now. We we came through uh, 2021 like there wasn't a drought, and and it was pretty bad. Uh, we, we really didn't have to, I mean, we, we did a few things, like uh, one of the things we do is we do have some hay ground and, and we grazed a lot of our hay ground. We didn't put up hay, uh, except here where we caught that heavy rain, we, we did hay a little bit there, but very little last year. We were able to, and again, flexibility and diversity, we grazed those hay fields, which is good for them. Mm -hmm. and, and for sure, the last thing they needed is be clipped off at the ground. Right. Uh, so again, if you don't have that kind of flexibility and, and uh, planning built into your, your plan, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a recipe for a problem. Okay. There's a lot to weigh uh, for you decision makers out there. Um, we don't intend to overwhelm, but we do want to point out some of the highlights for sure. 
and uh, if you've entered 2022 and find yourself in a tight spot, whether that be financially or with regard to your forage uh, or any number of other circumstances, we want you to know that there are resources out there. Jim has mentioned more than once other individuals, your, your personal friends and contacts, uh, business partners, whether that's the person who buys your livestock from one year to the next, uh, your, your lender, if you're in a situation where you have an operating loan, um, the clergy in your, in your church, if you're a person of faith, uh, and it could simply be a member of the member, a member of the Grassland Coalition, the mentor network. Um, these folks have volunteered to serve in that capacity and really do welcome the telephone calls, uh, invitations to visit your place if they're not too terribly far away. Uh, bounce some ideas off of them, share, share what you're struggling with, and uh, because the true intent is, is that they don't want you to make the same mistakes that they did. Not all of the mentors are, are in their 60s or 70s. Some of them are young, but they have a wealth of experience on the topics that they've signed up for. So if you have interest in that document, contact the Grassland Coalition and we will get it to you. Let me add one thing to that, Tance, and you, and you said it very well. Uh, but I think uh, for anybody that may be viewing this that uh, knows they need to take a different approach to the way they're doing business, uh, drought or no drought, uh, mm -hmm. and are, are seeing advantages to maybe taking that holistic approach and doing business different. If, if, if you don't feel like what you're doing is, is uh, working right, you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Something needs to change. And one of the things, and, and we were there uh, in, the, in the 80s, and we did a lot of changing and still do changing, but one of the things we learn, not only are, are the people that you, you do business with, uh, associate with, reach out to, but one of the things we learned real quick is the people that uh, you do business with, uh, ag-related, but not maybe um, directly grass-related, uh, I, I ended up changing veterinaries to, to be more in tune with this approach of of being regenerative, uh, changing. I mean, who ever heard of fence line weaning calves and calving in May? I mean, this was this was back in the <laughs> early 90s, probably. I don't even remember what year it was, but it, it was off the wall and uh, quit pouring livestock and stuff. I mean, you, you need a, a special veterinary to support that kind of thinking. You need a special banker that'll tolerate all of a sudden uh, you're, you're, you're selling uh, five-weight calves in December instead of six-weight calves the first of November. Uh, uh, so we, we changed, and, and feed, feed the consultant, uh, we, we changed all those people to fit into the way we wanted to do business. And, and my advice to, to people that may be listening to this is, is work with people that'll work with you. Because... Uh, there's a host of people out there, their main goal is selling you something and it may not be in your best interest. When we've been talking about planning the annual grazing rotation and, and recognizing drought symptoms, if you will, Jim, you mentioned the term trigger dates more than once. Uh, and I'd like to know what that looks like here on the daybreak. Yeah. Well, uh, interestingly, a lot of people have trigger dates in the spring, and we do as well, but we have also one in the fall because uh, uh, if, if and, and last year we were really lucky to get some uh, from about the middle of August to the middle of October, we had significant rainfall for that time of the year, above average, mm -hmm. not for the year, but for that sure. time frame. Mm -hmm. So October 1 is, is our first maybe more of an observation date than a trigger date. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if we were in bad enough shape, which we might be this year, that means maybe we let the calves go uh, instead of keeping them around during the winter. Uh, maybe we cut down our cow herd uh, to make sure we're still in business. So October can be very, very important. Uh, and it sure is from a moisture. And it's a really good time to evaluate what you have for any feed sources, whether you can make it through the winter if you get 100 inches of snow. Yeah. Um, it's a good time to evaluate what you've got for residue left out there, whether you have some dormant grass. So October 1 is, is huge. Uh, our next one is 
is May 1, and I know that's later than a lot of people, but, but that tells us, gives us that chance to go through April and see where we're at for moisture. Uh, not that we may not take some action earlier in that, but that's, that's a desperation time, May 1. Uh, so that's, that's our, our next trigger date, uh, and, and we're looking at that all through April then, but May 1 is, is, is a trigger date. Time, time to take action. Right. Say. Yeah. You may be and, and, I, and I skipped the, the middle one, a April 1 is also because then you can evaluate again uh, your livestock classes, what you've got, what you've had for winter moisture and, uh, and, and going into, but, but May 1 is our, our final trigger date. Uh, and, and not, again, not that that don't mean we wouldn't sell additional livestock or move them off the place in, in July, say. But, but we know we're in trouble when, when we get to May. Yep, yep. Um, we haven't said this out loud. Jim has mentioned it for this ranch that April moisture is probably the most important that, it that is. comes down the line. Yep. Um, but in general terms, wherever in our state or even in neighboring states that you might be watching from, uh, the months of April, May, and June really drive grassland production um, in the upper Great Plains not at the expense or the complete exclusion of other months, but those three really do drive um, what we can expect, coupled with that previous fall of moisture like Jim has mentioned. Yep, and uh, again, each ranch is different. We're predominantly cool season grass. Well, June 1, uh, it's way too late for cool season grass, and that's why our final trigger date is May 1. If it, if it was all warm season grass, well, it might be July 1. Yep. Uh, but and we do have warm season grass that's really bailed us out a number of times but since we're so predominantly cool season May 1 is what really sets the stage for the ranch yep. Yep. and I would make the case that the further west you go the more reliant upon cool season grasses you become um, it, it just as you move further east across our state you get closer and closer to what was the remnant tall grass prairie and uh, and that's where where that summertime moisture and really, the climate does lend itself to that. That right. we catch those those uh, summertime thunder showers that that will, in the course of three miles, go from three tenths to to an inch sixty or whatever it was yeah. in your example. Um, and, and not that that doesn't happen everywhere across the landscape at some point in time, but uh, the likelihood of it is certainly higher the further east you go. So, I I, I think we have to accept the fact that that. Uh, you can call it climate change or weather change, whatever you want to, but my observations is that our seasons have shifted a little bit. You know, springs are, are later and, and falls are too, the start of fall. Um, and, and the weather is so extreme. I mean, either, either we're 20 degrees below normal or 20 degrees above, either we aren't getting any rain or we're having thunder floods. Mm -hmm. uh, Temperature swings are just unbelievable, uh, and and it's maybe the new norm, and we have to plan accordingly. I've been a part of a number of conferences that that are indicating that your your personal observation is kind of the trend line is that uh, um, we may tend to be warmer and um, for longer, many more days, maybe not a lot more days, but in in ecological terms, that kind of change is pretty significant. Um, and the one thing that the forecasters have shared uh, in the scientific world is that while our precipitation patterns you know, for annual averages may not be changing significantly, at least not in a statistics related manner, uh, that we have more intense yep. precipitation events yep, uh, I would agree. spread out further apart. With that in mind, Treating your grazing lands in such a way that builds the capacity to infiltrate water as rapidly as possible is the way to defend yourself Absolutely. and build resilience. Absolutely. Um, so certainly look at the resources that Jim has mentioned. We'll have links posted on both the sdgrass.org website as well as the sddroughtplan.org website, which is a link and a product of the Grassland Coalition. And uh, the tagline there, pray for rain, plan for drought. Amen. I have one final question, Jim, I, and, and I feel like maybe we've loaded the gun a little bit, but... Um, that don't maybe, sound good. No, it doesn't. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's not the right way to phrase it. But, uh, uh, 
we've talked about planning and and how the how folks might use the topics we've discussed uh, to be better prepared for the next drought. But for those that have their back against the wall already and are literally putting out fires uh, with flames, or or if they're just in crisis mode, having to liquidate many of the livestock on the operation. Um, maybe are seeking off-farm jobs, what have you, um, just just to make it through. Uh, probably are feeling like you're out of options. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have any wisdom that you can impart uh, on what first steps they should take um, and uh, the resources that they can reach out to, things like that. Yeah. Well, the first thing you need to keep in mind is, is you could listen to me all day and talk about my operation, but, but anybody else's operation is different. It, it don't matter if you're five miles down the road or, or 250 miles down the road. Uh, everybody's resources available is different. Their landscape's different. Their circumstances are different. Their uh, financial situation is different. Their, their stage in life is different. Uh, so those are all critical, but, but the big thing is to reach out to people that, that have that valuable experience and, and many of the people on, well, I'd say all the folks on the Grassland Coalition board have had that experience and, and many off of the board. Uh, if, if you know of uh, people that are maybe doing a little thing, things a little different on down the road, reach out to them. Uh, reach out to those uh, expert sources that that can maybe tell you you need to talk to somebody else mm -hmm. uh, that can yeah. really put you in connection with with somebody that has has lived through that situation but 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 this uh, this this isn't the time to just crawl into a hole and, and hope for rain uh, it, it does take some action but it needs it needs to apply to your own operation and, and you need to know what your resources are uh, and, and the situation you're in, uh, what you can do. But, but I'll say it again, there is life after cows. And, and that's where I was in, in uh, 1976. I was sitting there with a, a cow enterprise. I was calving in March. I was going for big calves. I was feeding them all winter. Uh, uh, completely different mindset than where I'm at now. Uh, and, and interestingly, our, our calf weights haven't gone down that much, but our profitability has gone up just unbelievable. So it can be done. I'm living proof, <laughs> still alive, still in operating, <laughs> and have changed about everything imaginable. Uh, and, and so there are those people out there that can, can give direction. And, and sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah. And, and to get somebody else's opinion and, and thoughts, uh, I, I've had some real uh, light bulbs come on by going on tours, uh, listening to other speakers, uh, going to ranching for profit, the grazing school. Um, and I, I think you could go to that stuff every year and you'd learn something. Yep. Uh, and and there, I just can't, can't uh, express the value of the information I've gotten from other people. Yeah. The exact circumstances may be different, but if you've walked through this a number of times between drought and uh, market uncertainties, high interest rates, right. uh, <clears throat> you name it, um, I, I like the way you've termed, yeah, yeah, we can call it a drought plan because that's our main topic here today, but, but this is disaster planning. Uh, another way to think about it is risk management. Absolutely. And, and that's, those are terms that your lender is certainly interested in. They want to see you succeed because when you succeed, you pay the interest on any notes that you have. And um, so reach out to these resources. Um, thank you to the Grassland Coalition for, for spurring this idea to put this video and audio series together. We hope that you're finding value in it. And uh, stay tuned for additional content to be posted as it comes available. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Jim.